Open the podcast doors, hell. It's Kubrick's universe. The Stanley Kubrick podcast. Yeah, actually, I was, yeah, I was about 20, but I was actually, if you remember, I was 19 in the film when number one in the charts was a song by Paul Hardcastle called 19. It was about Vietnam. In World War II, the average age of the combat soldier was 26. In Vietnam, he was 19. In, 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 in Vietnam, he was 19. Is that the same? Yeah. What year was that? 81 or something. Uh, it must have been 84, must have been. Oh, you must have been Sorry, of course. Yes, 84. 19. What a great song. Mm. The, the average age of the combat soldier was 19. 20, was, was 26. <laughs> the, the average age of the combat soldier was 26 in Vietnam. He was 19. That's right. And it went like that, if you remember. In Saigon, a US military spokesman said today more than 700 I Good think idea. it was number one when we was we was number one in the charts when we was on the set in, in Beckton in London and everyone used to play in the car because we were all laughing about it because we, you know, we were filming a Vietnam film in London and number one in the charts in England needs a song about Vietnam. That's a bit weird. None of them received a hero's welcome. D. Bush. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Step inside, step inside. Kubrick's Universe. Hey, and thanks for joining us at the All Things Stanley Kubrick Podcast. At the boards is the fantabulous Stephen Rigg. I am your host and humble narrator, Jason Furlong. Okay, so we have a fun show for you with a pretty unique guest and a very cool guy. His name is Adrian Bush. He goes by 80. In 1985, 80 was a 19-year-old British Army reservist who learned that a call had been put out for military extras for an upcoming film production. The film turned out to be Kubrick's inimitable 1987 Vietnam War examination, Full Metal Jacket. 80 was cool enough to spend some time and share his stories with us, and today you're going to hear him talk about his experiences on and off the set, including, but not limited to, his six weeks preparation with U.S.-style military training, filming the battle sequences at Becton Gas Works, dodging some scorching hot shells from blanks that fell all around him during one particular scene, his own time spent photographing the set, working with R. Lee Ermey, the unexpected death of a colleague who was also working on the film, playing several different background parts, and witnessing the police called after reports of the massive amounts of burning black tires used caused a haze of pollution over nearby London. But you'll also hear A.D. talk about encountering strippers with American actor Ed Touchdown O'Ross at a local pub, how O'Ross ended up recording a song with UK music legend Paul Hardcastle during the filming of Full Metal Jacket, and how he finally became cool in the eyes of his teenage son. Hint, it has to do with his son hearing his friends tell him that his dad was in a Stanley Kubrick movie. Hmm. Perfectly timed water pipes. Again. So without any more ado, we welcome to the show A.D. Bush. A.D., thanks so much for being with us, man. How you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on, on the show. Oh, it's our pleasure, man. Sincerely. Uh, listen, you know that Kubrick's 12th feature film was Full Metal Jacket, and Stanley released it in 1987. The film follows a platoon of new recruits on an eight-week training course at the Paris Island Marine Corps Recruit Depot in South Carolina, USA. Uh, this section of the film was actually shot at Basingbourne Barracks in Cambridge, England, as many of you know. And then the film moves on to Vietnam, uh, where we follow two of the original recruits into warfare, along with a new platoon of young Marines. Now, the Vietnam section of the film was filmed at the disused Becton Gas Works in London. 
Kubrick saw this uh, dilap- uh, dilapidated site on British TV and immediately, immediately saw the potential in recreating war-torn cities, which he needed, uh, and the villages of Vietnam. Uh, so he chose to shoot uh, all the uh, entire sequence at Beckton Gasworks. And today, we are really fortunate to be speaking with A.D., whose uh, real name, his full name is Adrian, but A.D. Bush was actually a member of that platoon and appeared in many scenes of the Vietnam section of the film. So I'll cut right into uh, my first question, which is, uh, how did you find yourself working on the set of Full Metal Jacket, this great big Hollywood-style production? Wow, wow, wow. There I was. I was a reservist in the army, um, locally to where I live. And um, a, um, a text or an email, it's not text nowadays, sorry, an email mm-hmm. come through to our commanding officer saying that there's a film being made in London and they're after um, soldiers who sort of know what they're doing on the battleground. And um, we just had an address uh, and a phone number. Um, a couple of us made the phone call. They asked us to go down, and before we knew it, we was on our way to um, London because I'm like a hundred miles away from London. Mm-hmm. And then we all we rang up and said, "Could we have the audition?" They said, "Yes, we want you come down." And when we got there, there was um, loads of us all auditioning for this these parts in in the film. Wow! Now, if I'm not mistaken, you were about 19, 20 years old uh, at the time. Yeah. Were, yep. were you aware? Were, were you aware of Stanley Kubrick, uh, the filmmaker, before you showed up? No, no, no. At the time, we just knew it, they were making a film. Um, we didn't even know it was a war film on Vietnam. We just knew it was a war film being filmed in London. The actual um, where they actually met us was at Beckton itself, where we did the rehearsals and um, the recruiting for it. And um, that's all we sort of knew, really. They sort of kept everything quiet. Hmm. So were you aware of uh, any Stanley Kubrick movies uh, prior to showing up for the audition? Like, had, had you ever seen Clockwork Orange or 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Shining? Yeah, I've seen The Shining, obviously, because I'm into my horror films. I always have been. So I've seen The Shining. I've, I've seen bits of 2001 Space Odyssey. Never seen Clockwork Orange until I knew who, who we were working for and with sort of mm. thing. Hmm. <laughs> So that's wow, that's pretty cool. And one day, yeah, there you are working for the man himself. Mm. And um, so, and, and there you are on the set, you know, from the very start of the film shoot, I believe from uh, about late August to uh, December of 1985. So, pretty much for the yeah. entire Vietnam section uh, that was shot at Beckton Gas Works. Um, is there any reason why you didn't work on the Paris Island section as well? Well, yeah, we, we 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 do all the combat scenes, obviously at Beckton, and then some some of the scenes, obviously at the um, army camp. Um, and then once all that had finished, they they picked only a few of us to be part of the platoon, to be at the Paris Island, to be the recruits, and only a few of us got in. Um, so, but they said we had to do full military training. So, believe it or not, we were trained for a whole six weeks in wow. military training, American style, because we were all English. We were used to bringing our, our legs up when we do a, a, a march, but they're, they're more laid back the American marching, so we had to learn all that, so we had to do full of military drill with Lee Ermey drilling us every single wow. day, five days a week. <laughs> and that was, that was something. So you were there, and uh, wow, that's really, I'm, I love learning about this kind of thing. You were there, and then the the differences in between your British training and the training that Lee Ermey, an American, you know, had to, and you endured six weeks to that just for the the, the part, and then I guess it didn't get used. That's still that that's hey, that's still a hell of a story, man. Yeah, well, all, all that training we did was being filmed by Stanley's daughter. She was filming that. She was there every day filming different bits of us. Even if I remember sitting down having tea, because. We all we all sat down and had, had tea and dinner and breakfast together with with the with the with the main actors Matthew Bodine Adam now Adam Baldwin was aware then it was it was obvious it was Lawrence <laughs> Gurma Pyle or or Matthew Modine. they were the only two with us but they were they were part of us they were when you do acting in England with the big stars they don't sit with the with the with the extras and with the support yeah, I... group they go off into their little caravans and, and don't 
trained with us. But um, Matthew did. He was one of the team, definitely. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And you said it, it was Vivian who was uh, there shooting a lot of that footage? Yeah, she she filmed a lot of it, which I don't think has ever really been a decent documentary come out about the making of Full Metal Jacket. Not what I've, not what I've seen, but she was filming a lot of it. She was watching us being beasted by um, Lee yeah. Hermie and shouting out because he did that in all the training and we had to learn the rifle training and, and all sorts. I mean, I got as far as I, I even had a name. I had my uniform and then everyone sort of had a big falling out over money. And um, because of the money mm. we was on in the combat scenes, the money dropped drastically when we started mm. filming the, the, the thing. And I says, come on, I've been on this much for now. And you dropped it to this much. It was quite a, a big, steep drop. So I um, I opted out and said, nah. I mean, I did film some of me in um, um, walking, the, I mean, walking around the, the um, bunk bed shouting. But um, obviously that never got seen. I got filmed having my hair shaven and, and all that. But um, that never got seen. But um, hey, I was there. <laughs> yeah, I, again, that's still a hell of a story. And no one can ever take that away from you, right? You no, that's there. definitely, definitely. Mm. So, I mean, and now, you know, so if you were there from late August to December of 85, you shot all those Vietnam scenes. That puts the shoot, you know, well into wintertime, the beginning of wintertime. And yet the, the finished film looks warm and tropical so my question yeah. is do you remember do you remember anything about like cold and wet weather uh, freezing weather the- yeah mm. Tell us. Well, well believe it or not um them days i was only a, a, a 11 stone chap and we were shivering but we used to have um we used to wear the green um winter marine coat under a normal shirt so we actually oh, wow. had the coat underneath. Instead of on top of us, we would have looked like we were freezing cold. We had to. We used to. We were told to put it underneath and then put a bigger shirt on over the top and a t-shirt underneath to hide the coat. So it made us obviously we we weren't cold then because um, it was from some of them nights. Some of the night scenes, if you remember, with the with the night scene when we were attacked by the the Vietnamese coming into the camp, that was filmed at night and it was really cold that night. But we had to have our heavy coats underneath our shirts. Wow. Yeah. I mean, doing what you have to do uh, to endure. I mean, it's impressive given that uh, your background was military, not acting. And yet, you know, you understood that the show must go on and uh, you, you, you rose to the challenge. I just think that's that's cool. I love learning about stuff like that. Um, and, you know, being on the set for so long, you know, we, we're, we're all, you know, aware that Kubrick was apparently not very big on passing around copies of the script. And I'd be remiss to not ask, did you ever see a copy of uh, the Full Metal Jacket script while you were on set? I didn't, but Kubrick was a, he was like a, he was like a father Christmas. He, he wouldn't say, he wouldn't say <laughs> much, but he would always be there when, when you, didn't want him to be there. We like some of the scenes he would take a shot of, which we were in some of them, and he would have us all come round the camera, which is a little tiny ten by ten camera to look at, to look at the scene, and he'd show us it all, and then and then not just the two of us, he'd have us all round. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some pictures around with us all looking around, but he'd go, come, all come in. Who was all in that scene? All come in now and look at this. I mean, we didn't we didn't know what we were looking at, but obviously he did. But you know, fair play to him to let us see what he had just filmed, and he yeah. said that's that's that, that, and so so he he was a nice chap, but a quiet chap, kept himself to himself. He didn't like people having cameras around him, but we all sort of got pictures of him from a distance if if we could, because he didn't mind us having cameras, taking pictures of us having fun on the set, because we all in between sets when we didn't have anything to do, we would either play football or, in my terms, soccer. In sure, yeah, call. no. I know, I, I know what you mean. And he didn't, he didn't mind all that, but he'd soon say, "Right, get him, come on, you lot, you're finished now. Come on, we need to get back onto this next set." So he, <laughs> he, he, he was fair, and he would, he would always, you know, on one of the night scenes, we worked quite late because it was pitch black at night, and he, and he, he ordered a takeaway, a, a pizza takeaway, and um, this car pulled up with about fifty pizzas in it. It's hilarious getting all these pizzas out because no one was cooking so all these pizzas are coming out we're sitting around eating pizzas at, at, it's like at night so he didn't let us go hungry that's one thing 
Well, like you said, a bit of like a Father Christmas. Yeah, yeah, he was. Um, if you, you know, if you could speak to him, but you'd go to our bloke who was a bloke called Chris, and then if we wanted to say something to Stanley, we'd go to Chris, and he was even scared to Stanley and say something to him. Oh, one of the blokes just said that, and he's like, "What? What? 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 What?" Oh, yes, but, uh, but yeah, but, but but that was Stanley. That's too cool. Too cool. <laughs> well, I mean. I I want to I want to pick your brain uh, about some of the particular scenes that you worked on. I'd love to ask you about them uh, if yeah. that's cool. Um, yeah, thanks, yeah. man. Thanks. Uh, like, well, let's start with the marine base scene. I believe that the first scene you appear in is the opening tracking shot, which introduces the U.S. Marine base in Da Nang, Vietnam. It's quite a big establishing shot. Uh, to say the least, yeah. you play one of the M- you're, you're an MP guarding the base in that yeah. long tracking shot. Um, it involves yeah. quite a long tracking shot, a helicopter, various background vehicles and 20 or 30 soldiers at least. And all of that needed chore- uh, you know, a choreography to pull off that shot. And so my question is, can you tell us how long, uh, if you recall, did it take to get that shot and to set it up and execute? Um, and then the follow-up question is, were there rehearsals with everyone getting synchronized? How many times was it done? Um, I think that one, well, the good thing about it was Martin Modine was a hell of an actor and he he, he knew what he was doing. So um, mm. a lot of the scenes which were just with Matthew in, um, Kevin Major Howard did quite a, bit, a few boo-boos on, his, on a lot of these scenes and they went on forever. But um, okay. Matthew was pretty good. So I think I, I've got to... It's hard to remember that far back. I think we did that one quite quick, but I remember the, the, the main problem was was getting the helicopter to keep going around in circles. Mm-hmm. So you had this, so you had this green helicopter flying around the east end of London with Marines on it. it was, must have been an eyesore for some of them people in living in London, thinking what the hell's going on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So every time that come round, you'd have the people on the walkie-talkies saying, "And action!" And if that was a miss with the helicopter, Stanley would say. Do it again. Get the helicopter around, and yep, until it yep. got in that scene bit, he, he would do it. But I don't think it took too long on that scene, so uh, that was quite a good one. And you know, were there uh, any number of rehearsals uh, uh, before shooting to get everyone synchronized? Yeah, well, they, Stanley would have obviously different people set in different places where you can't see, and then it, it, the radios are sort of go around in the circle going action and then you'd go and you'd say Chris action then you'd go Neil action so we all knew where we would where we would walk as they're walking along so um, it was all synchronised it was like a synchronised acting bit with the with the walkie talkies saying when when to the next one to walk the next one to walk you see the yeah. scene when Matthew Modi is in the town when the girl and the boy nick his camera uh-huh. which is a typical typical scene of if you watch the cars, they're just the same cars going round from and round, one point round. Yes, to another. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I love it. I know. Oh, he was so good at that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, so that was quite good. That's brilliant. I mean, and he, he did that, of course, with the, the, the same helicopters circling round and back uh, mm. uh, in the final act when they're approaching uh, uh, the, 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 the area where the sniper is. And I think it's just like six or eight helicopters that, you know, he just had him loop around and make it look like it was, you know, 20, 30 helicopters, just, keep, just doing it out of shot. Uh, that's, so let me move on because, uh, you know, the next scene that you were in is also another Marine base scene. Uh, and it comes right after the one that I just asked you about uh, at the U S Marine base in Da Nang. And this one is, is another tracking shot, but this time it's following Joker and Rafter man through the base camp. And you play one of the MPs. This time you're passing by on the back of a Jeep, holding on yeah. to a rather large machine gun, uh, if that's, I recall that's, correctly. Yeah. That's, that's then, correct. That's really cool because, I mean, I, 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 I saw Full Metal Jacket twice in the theater when I was, uh, you know, uh, 17 when it came out. And uh, I, I've seen it countless times since. And I... It's just kind of cool. I'm not a starstruck guy, but it's cool that I get because I remember noticing you and thinking like, 
You know, I always look at the everything that's going on in the shot, everything in the frame. And uh, today I'm getting the chance to uh, chat with you, and it's just really cool. That that's a that's a long tracking shot as well, like the one at the uh, opening of the the base in Da Nang. And yeah. just like the previous one, it involved a full exchange of uh, um, uh, dialogue uh, between the uh, Joker man and uh, I'm sorry, Joker and Rafter man. And, you know, it's basically the same question where there, you know, a number of rehearsals to get everyone synchronized and how many times, you know, how many takes that he did. Well, <laughs> this is a funny one because this is the one where after man got it wrong, wrong, wrong. And I think it's in black and white about him getting this wrong from Matthew in his book, um, Full Metal Jacket Diary, or, or he said it on, on TV somewhere. But he, he, he got it so wrong so many times. I was on the Jeep, just out of shot, ready to for action before I come and go past them. And because he got it wrong so many times, I'm so laid back on the back of this um, um, Jeep, um, I didn't realise he said action. So the bloke put his foot down and I fell off the back. And I oh, fell shit. straight off. And, we, and we're oh, quite no. high. And I fell off the back <laughs> and they've gone, cut, cut, cut. And then, and then, and then, and they've said, well, hang on a minute, something's happened, someone's injured. And then, um, Obviously, I took my arm and I hurt my leg, but then days I was super fit. And um, the nurse came right. up and said, no, I'm fine. I've just cut my arm. So he said, oh, no, I'd have to do it again. I think it was in it. It was, it was, it took, um, that was the night we had the pizzas as well. <laughs> because oh, it no, went on for so long. That little sucker really had some moves on him, didn't he? Yeah. You know what really pisses me off about these people? What? We're supposed to be helping them and they shit all over us every chance they get. I just can't feature that. Don't take it too hard, Rafter man. It's just business. I hate the name, Joker. I want to go out into the field. I've been in country almost three months and all I do is take handshake shots at award ceremonies. You get wasted your first day in the field and it'd be my fault. A high school girl could do my job. I want to get out to the shit. I want to get some trigger time. If you get killed, your mom will find me after I rotate back to the world and she'll beat the shit out of me. It's a negative, Rafter, man. I, I, th I think I, you're correct that uh, Matthew does mention it in, uh, in, in Full Metal Jacket Diary and in the app that uh, he developed with Adam Rakoff. But uh, it's still cool to hear you tell the story because you were there. And so do you have any any ballpark uh, number on how many takes were done? Like how many times did? Uh, uh, I know it took I know it took hours, and I know Stanley was losing his temper. I always think he was getting on twenty twenty odd twenty thirty takes. We wow. were just going backwards and backwards. It was like, whoa! What is because I remember one point someone saying, "What is going on? Why aren't we doing this?" And they said, "Everyone says Rasta man, it kept, which was Kevin Major Howard." Kevin Major Howard. Wrong. Right. Yeah, he, oh he keeps gosh. getting it wrong. We were like, oh man, come on, we need to do this. And obviously we were freezing cold as well. Oh my gosh, yeah, because now you're getting into, uh, you know, full-on mm. winter. So, okay, now, you know, in the next Marine base scene, uh, there's uh, the scene that we see Joker, Rafter Man, and the others in their bunks kind of chilling out in the hooch. Suddenly we hear distant bombs, incoming trouble, and this is a night yeah. scene, of course. And we see you running down past the huts towards the That's action true. at the entrance where the Viet uh, Cong are about to storm the base. Uh, can you tell us your recollections about shooting that scene? Again, that comes, comes after a long, complicated tracking shot. And then as they... Well, obviously, from, from that bit there, when they start running, it obviously it's cut then because the next mm -hmm. scene is us running past. And there's the, obviously I'm the second runner behind ev everyone, but obviously when we get to the end of the um, <clears throat> the run, we go off, but they run in. Then it's cut, and then they mm -hmm. run into the uh, bunkers, if you remember, and start shooting yep. at the. Um, well, that is a quite a good scene because Stephen will tell you now he's actually got the only picture I would say out of the whole of Full Metal Jacket film, which has never been seen. Because we were told to get well away from the explosion of the, um, the 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 car coming through the barriers and blowing up, because there was actually a man in there, a stunt man, yeah, and yeah. he was all oiled up. And but I 
Right. Me and another couple of guys, we went just right hand side of it in this little hut, which we weren't supposed to. And I took a picture with my little Olympus camera, which I'd won in a boxing competition when I was <laughs> boxing. And I took this picture, and and then just as it went through, I just pressed the pressed the button a few times. And obviously, when I got home and got them developed, I thought, "Oh my God, I can't believe I got this." But as the explosion went off, because we were quite close, the hut we was in just got battered with shrapnel coming off his car and then obviously the bloke got out it's full on fire then the fire had to come in and put him out and everyone and and it was and we did that in one take wow um i've i've seen that that photo uh of yours courtesy of steven and uh it's just extraordinary that you got that i mean you cannot get closer to that and not be in uh serious danger and uh it, that's that's again that's just like one of those awesome memories i i imagine you know you you have to you know have these uh feelings of like well they can't take that away from me um no no i can actually bring that photo up i'm looking at it right now it's just an extraordinary shot that you you took of the explosion um and you know that 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 whole firefight and uh, and then there's uh the subsequent scene in which you were in uh, is in Vietnam uh, proper. It's when uh, Joker and Rafter Man disembark from the chopper and you run in the opposite direction, carrying an injured uh, Marine on a stretcher. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I imagine a scene like that was pretty intense to be in the middle of with the massive Marine helicopter and other activity what are your recollections of shooting that day? Getting hot because when we put the um, person uh, on the stretcher into the helicopter, if you look at the helicopter, the pipe, the exhaust pipe, all uh, that we is is, yep. is hitting yep. us, and the heat coming out of that. I just remember everyone coming away from it, laughing their heads off, going, "Jesus Christ! I think we've got sunburnt from that because yeah. the heat was was like was hitting us." And so that was quite a funny scene because. Because of because of that, that's all I can remember is the heat coming off the helicopter when when we couldn't we chucked the person in it and then we ran off and then and then and then obviously we got away from it. We, we nearly got to go on that helicopter. They was gonna they 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 stopped it. They was gonna get us to put the stretcher on the helicopter and then they were gonna fly off, but they didn't in the end, which was a shame because we was all looking forward to getting hooked up into the helicopter and going up like, but we didn't. But um, no, my recollection was that it was. Was um running was the helicopter exhaust by keeping us warm that night definitely. Well, you know, I mean, I, if I recall correctly, you can actually see the vapors coming out of that exhaust pipe right yeah. towards you and the other actors, and that's that you know it's it's visible on the screen. It's there's no mistaking that's you know obviously a a a, a real thing that's happening to the actors yeah. like as the camera's rolling and. Uh, you know, obviously there was no CGI yet, but there, I mean, the, even CGI wouldn't be able to replicate the realism of something like that. When you see uh, you guys just getting that that blast of of, of heat expulsion, and it mm. adds to the authenticity. It really does. So, I mean, now in Huey City, um, this is one of my favorite kind of taking advantage of cinema type scenes uh, yeah. to use a phrase. We see a three man news crew in the foreground moving right to left as Kubrick's camera tracks left with them. And we see various Marines performing to the camera. It's shot in one take, possibly two. And you are again featured in this awesome scene. You make a very funny little eye flash to the camera. Again, a very yeah. involved scene with tanks firing in the foreground. 
blasts off in the distance, dialogue, again, really technical stuff, so much rehearsal. So how many takes? Um, I think that only took about, about three, I only took about three or four takes that one did. But um, obviously the, the build up to it before they, they did the filming was quite, quite a long time because we had to, I remember the, I remember the track of the camera behind was on a track so they went along on a track, obviously, and then the then the then the camera moving in front of them, and then mm-hmm. then we're sitting down. So it's so it's like a three image sort of thing, really, from the cameraman to the ca- them filming us. And um, I, I didn't take too too many too many. I, I Stanley would always sort of um, have everything set up well before he did the take, knowing that he was close to the take before he actually went on and filmed it. Because mm-hmm. because because the thing I remember of that scene more than anything was the bullets when they were firing them out the tank was above me, the blanks were all falling down on us. And I remember yeah. picking one up and they were roasting hot, thinking, whoa, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, it, it, Steve, Steve's probably got that one now. <laughs> it's, uh, you've got that one, Steve. <laughs> I think Stephen is in possession of that. Oh, is that yeah. the one I've got? It's still hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's still hot. <laughs> Did you take the gunpowder out of that other one? <laughs> no, but I'm th- no, but I'm thinking of going to my local army army supply shop and getting them to uh, just like decommission it because <laughs> I've, I've got kids around and I don't want them to be playing with it. <laughs> yeah, I told you there was gunpowder in that big one, isn't there? I'm not sure. Is it the big? Yeah, is it that? Is it that really big one that's about what seven or eight inch long? It's a big. If you one, shake then. it, you can you can. You can the gunpowder's still in it. So right. that was one. Some of the blanks, some of them were blanks and never, and never fired. Obviously, there's not a bullet in the end of it. But the one which came down, which you've got now, I picked up and I remember it was hot and I burnt my hand. I thought, like, well, shit, that's hot because obviously it's just come out of the magazine. And then um, I thought, oh, I'll keep that. <laughs> it, even the even the rifles um, were real rifles in the film. They just came in the back of the car and he's just yeah. opened the back of the car flashing the card and they'd just say yeah take one of them out mate even the m60 the big one which animal would have used i mean i got my photo with that and we all we all had to go and and uh, held that but um they were just in the back of a car he just used to roll up open the back so yeah take what you want lads so I mean, yeah that was crazy imagine doing that these days well yeah i mean it was a different time to be sure mm. but um well, I mean, w- without going into detail, I mean, it's it's known that, that, you know, Kubrick did have some kind of interest in firearms. And I'm sure he understood that, you know, rule number one is, you know, safety. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, d- d- definitely. So, well, let me get back to, uh, you know, parts of the shoot uh, that you were involved with, like the... Uh, uh, it was it was during the Vietnam part of the shoot that R. Lee Ermey was working as a technical advisor on the film, and he didn't appear on camera at all uh, during those scenes. Uh, but once the production moved to the training barracks, Lee ended up in front of the camera, uh, playing arguably the most significant, certainly the most uh, impactful role in the film. Uh, now, my dad sat next to uh, Lee Ermey on a cross-country flight, and couldn't have said nicer things about the guy. It was just happenstance, and uh, they had a great conversation. But can you talk to us about uh, working with Lee and your me- your uh, memory of it, of him? Yeah, well, well, well Lee Ernie was the second person we met when we got interviewed for the job, when we had to have the audition. Um, when we went down the first time, it was just a matter of filling the form out, put down what you've done, what you've, how old you are, name and address, and, and so on. And then obviously we all went home and then the second time we were told to go down and we were meeting um, the advisor on the set, which, as you know, was Lee Ermey. And um, we got there and um, he um, he said, right, and then we had to um, go in front of him. He'd shout at us as loud as he could and we had to stand there as still as possible. Mm-hmm. Then we were given a rifle and we were told to go behind the cabin, the cabin where we were where we were being interviewed, and then we had to, he said, right, I want to go behind the cabin, and when I say action, I want you to come behind the cabin and as, as if you're coming towards a, um, a sniper or, or someone of the enemy. But obviously we knew what we were doing because mm-hmm. some of the people who were auditioning hadn't had military experience like we had, and they, right. would, they were sticking their, their gun out and their head out. You mm. always stick your head out first before the gun 
to look right. round because the right. gun would give you away because you'd, you'd right. put your gun out for so obviously he, we knew he what he was looking at then so obviously mm-hmm. we stuck our head out without the gun and then we would go around and then he would say right come towards me quietly and then he'd say when I on, when I say action I want to run at the camera the camera's also go and shout as loud as you can at the camera and that's what we all had to do mm. and then um, then after that one um I think it was a matter of I had a phone call at home, no cell phones, no no mobiles then. And um, my mum said, them, you just had a phone call from Harry Films. You got the part in the film. And then obviously we met um, Lee then. Um, like like everyone else, Lee had dinner with us. He sat with us. He told us a few stories about um, being in Vietnam and being a good instructor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the same, breakfast, dinner and tea, nice chap. Couldn't say nothing wrong about him. He was just a nice, genuine chap. We'd all go into wardrobe together and get powdered down because <laughs> the um, we used to have a laugh with it because the um, the, the chap who run the wardrobe was um, a a gay gentleman. I think Mom was in, really nice guy, but he used to powder us down with a cloth. But in the cloth, he used to put um, flour and then pass us down. But he always used to like us. He always used to like to pass us down in the region <laughs> we didn't want him to. <laughs> <laughs> which he did and we'd all go oi leave it alone and he used to say oh sorry I'd slipped <laughs> <laughs> and, Lee, and, and, and Lee always used to say and I'm, I'm a crack about that being saying you know, be careful when you go into wardrobe you know what he's going to do oh so um, that was always a funny bit <laughs> that's brilliant because one of one of our one of our um, soldier lads with us he, he sort of hung on to him and, and, and did a lot of work with him in the wardrobe because we all had our own uniform we had to hang up at the end of the thing and make sure we got that the next day with our name on it. And then a little bit more. <laughs> and, it, sa- it sounds like one of uh, 80s uh, uh, platoon mates uh, didn't mind the uh, the powder so much either. <laughs> we, we all wonder what happened with him if he went in. Cause, cause, cause one day, they, they, <laughs> they come in one day with a black eye and so did the chap who used to help him. So we didn't oh, know no. what went on, but no one asked. Yes, yeah, so I remember that. Oh, now it's coming gosh. back. <laughs> and we were like, ooh, what's happened here? So, you know, <laughs> hey, 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 in that case, you know what they say. Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> no, no, we didn't that was, ask. That was, I remember that was, talking about it. That was the Amer- that was the American military's new campaign in the early 90s when they wanted to allow... Uh, gay people to serve. Bill Clinton, the president at the time, said the policy was going to be don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> so yeah, I had to slip that joke in, yeah, regarding the black guy. That's awful, though, that happened to him. We shouldn't make light, but um, yeah. it's all in good fun. <laughs> we, we did have a stuntman on the set, but he never got used. I don't know who, I, I remember, and I remember he was quite famous for playing a monkey, though, and I don't know what it was in, but we never used him because hmm. he. I actually approached him about stunt work and he actually said to me um, he's interested in a, a young recruit to be train up but obviously with no phones and nothing in them days he never got back to me but um, he used to go behind the, the, in somewhere private from where we all were to sunbathe naked <laughs> believe it or not I remember him, uh-huh. everyone saying have you seen what he's doing up there he's sunbathing naked and he, uh-huh. he was a naturist and I can't remember what his name was, but he wasn't the stunt man who did the car scene when the car blew up. Nat- naturist, is that what they call it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's called okay. naturist. Yeah. Yeah, there doesn't there doesn't seem to be any stunt men listed, does there, on the credits for film? I've never noticed that. There's not a stunt. Me neither. There's, there's no stunt man in the credits. Hmm. Yeah, there was a stunt man in the car when it crashed through that barrier. There's actually a bloke driving that. He yeah. actually got out full on fire. Yeah. Yeah, there's got to have been some stunt men on there, but yeah, there's none. There's none listed. Wow. I mean, a little. I'll tell you a little story now. Do you remember when Animal Mother, towards the end, ran towards the building where the sniper was hiding? Yeah, of course. Right in in that scene there, we we was all at the back watching that because it had all the main characters now, but we watched it. And um, in that scene there, which they did a few takes for it, when he had to run across holding his big M40, I think it was, shooting at the, at the two, at the two um, buildings. Mm-hmm. When he got there, he was that tired and whinging about how knackered he was because it took so many takes. This little tiny five-foot nurse had to run to him with an oxygen bottle to give him oxygen because he was out of breath. And we would all go in, how can he be like that when this little tiny nurse 
he's like five foot of, yeah. <laughs> running on with the full oxygen thing, giving him oxygen because he was like out of breath. Wow. But, yeah, that was quite funny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we used to think, obviously, because we're in, we used to think, you wimp, you real wimp. When you, <laughs> you know, you blame the big man on it, but he weren't the big man really because he had to have oxygen just do a, a, a 30 metre run with a, a gun which was not that heavy. And there was this little nurse running on. I remember coming back to her saying, oh, I've got to go again. And she used to run on with the oxygen, give him oxygen, then she'd run back off again to do another take. She did that quite a few times. And we thought we were so proud of her because she was quite a nice lady and, and used to be on the set every day with us having dinner and breakfast and so on. But there she was running on, giving him oxygen, Aww. where he's the big man in the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he's a- animal mother. I mean, he's... And a- Adam Baldwin is uh, a pretty big dude in real life, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Um, yeah, we had a, we had a, one of the huts was was full of weights. We used to do weightlifting in there with him because he has, he had to keep himself quite muscled up for the film. So yeah, he'd yeah. go off set, do some weightlifting, and then come back onto the set to be pumped up. Well, obviously, Derma Pie wouldn't he go and eat donuts? <laughs> what was the name of the chap in the film? I can't remember now. Who was out of Hill Street Blues? The Mexican guy, Lopez. On, was he was up. he in Hill Street Blues? Uh, yeah, he was in Hill Street Blues. His, his last name's Lopez, <laughs> isn't it? Um, let's see. Yeah, because he in in the um, in the film because I was a young boxer then in the film, and um, I was in between takes. We all used to do different things. I brought out my skipping rope, and I was skipping. And everyone's like, "Whoa, shit! This kid can skip!" And Thingy was an ex-boxer, um, Edo Ross, and he said, "Give me a go," and he had a go, but. And, but this Lopez asked me if I could help him learn him to skip. And I learned him to skip. And I think on the photo, of one of the photos um, with me and him on the poster, which you've got now, Steve, he's got a ha- he's got a, a, a skipping rope in his hands. And I, 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 went and, I went and bought him the skipping rope and gave it him because he wanted a good skipping rope. It was a leather one. Yes, and I has. went to the famous... And I went to the famous Longsdale shop in London and got him the rope and then give it him as a as a no a gesture saying I bought you this mate because he I learned him how to skip on the set believe yeah, it or not yeah yeah he's, he's holding them in his hands it's like the classic uh, the classic uh, wooden wooden handled ones yeah, isn't it? yeah 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 with the bill bearings in the in the, in the bit which spin round so yeah 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 yep, yep. that's it Good there man. we are <laughs> in, in all in all this Sandy's daughter was always filming something because, well, that's what gets me. Why didn't she make something big on this? Always, it's, I remember filming us having dinner and, and having a joke and a laugh together. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of conjecture about what may or may not ever become of uh, all of Vivian's footage. But you, you actually had a, 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 you know, you mentioned you had a still camera during your time on the set. And Stephen and I have had the pleasure of seeing quite a lot of your personal collection. And, and thank you so much for sharing the, those with us. I, I mean, y- you have some great pictures of yourself with all the main cast. And yeah. there's one uh, that you took of, of Kubrick, you know, like almost in a bombed out building sitting by himself. That was like manna from heaven when I saw that shot. And so just tell us how you managed to get all those great pictures, if you can. Um, well, I, like I said, I had this little camera I used to take on set of me, a little 35 mil Olympus it was. And um, we just used to get a shot um, when we could. I mean, it, I mean, some of the lads took some like, big cameras on them. They must have had some amazing shots, but probably better than mine. But And then we just used to get shots with them. With, with the with the main with the main lads in the platoon bits, and but we we never had the camera when we were doing uh, the only camp pitch I didn't get a picture with was um during a pile the only Lawrence, mm. and it was the only one I didn't get a picture with because we didn't have the camera then because we were doing full military drill, and um I think it got it tightened up a bit more with cameras then he was Sammy was a bit easier on the cameras in the um Vietnam scenes because um it was more laid back we had, we had like a haircut and we were scruffy and and mm. i think he sort of chilled out and a bit more on that but he always did state don't bring a camera near me and don't take a picture of me he, right, he was, right he was always told to be, do not take a picture of sunny hence while i've got that picture at quite a distance away I just yeah yeah just, yeah just clicked well, it, it and was i just re- clicked it it was respectful the way i th- i think it's it's okay i mean not that it's my my place to say but 
you you did capture a little uh, uh, treasure by taking that photo, and you certainly respected him by taking it from such a distance that... I've just got to tell you one story um, from the film, which we all found funny. I told it to Stephen the other day. Um, just around the corner when we used to work at the weekends from the set in, in Beckton, there was a little pub, and every Saturday dinner time, they used to have this this stripper on. Um, we all used <laughs> to go down there, take our, take our, our jackets off and just put our normal coats on. And we'd have an hour, an hour and a half, and we'd go in there. Um, Edo Ross, the one particular day, said, where do you lads go on a, on a good time? And he said to go to the pub down the corner and have a quick beer. And, um, and there's a stripper on, and he was like, whoa, a stripper? He said, I want to come. So we all went, <laughs> and he was a bit lag- lagging behind a bit. So <laughs> next minute, we're all in the pub, Next minute, the door's open. It's like something out of a cowboy film. And Edo Ross walks in in his full combat gear. He's got a sidearm. <laughs> he's got a grenade hanging off him. And everyone, and then the whole pub has just stopped and gone quiet. It was as if the, the craze had walked into this pub in the middle of East End and everyone's gone, oh, shit, oh what's going God. on here? <laughs> and then I remember one of the lads going, you can't come in like that. And he's what, what? And um, it just went quiet. And then um, they, um, we took him outside and... Um, took him back in the cheek to the set and then um, made him take his um, stuff all off and put a jacket on and brought him back. But that, that was that was one of the things I, re- I remember being really funny. <laughs> wow, nice. Oh, my God. Well, you, just, you, you picture that now. You're in the pub on a Sunday, Saturday dinner time and him, him walks a boat with a full... He's got a flat jacket on, grenade hanging off him, a sidearm. Hey, and he says, lads, where are you? Well, what's, going, what's going on? And the old bub's just gone. Whoa! Hang on a minute. What's going on here? It, it, but, um, it, that was quite it, funny. It, it, it sounds as though uh, he, he wasn't used to our culture of having uh, Sunday and Saturday lunchtime strippers, and he was that keen to get down there. He just forgot to go to wardrobe and get get his kit. <laughs> he, he forgot to. Uh, yeah, we we would take our jackets off and put our coats on, yeah. but he just walked in like that with everything on, and everyone was like, "Well, you can't come in like that." And the whole pub, obviously, the local London East Enders were in there thinking, oh, "Well, hang on a minute, God. this is not real." <laughs> Oh my God, that's br- what was the stripper's reaction when she saw him walk in? I think he might have put a couple of quid in her pot at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> she 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 walked she walked around after her 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 fee was to walk around with a pint glass and everyone put their change and money. Obviously, there was no pound coins in day, so you put the highest amount of dollar then was a 50 pence piece Steve as you know so everyone would just fill her pint mess up and that was her money she'd just strip off and mess around I think she messed around with him for a bit and had a bit of a play with um, with Ed I'm, I'm sure if we ever got to speak to him he'd, he'd remember that quite well because it was quite funny at the time he was the talk <laughs> oh my of the day God, I love it <laughs> and obviously it, it, when, when we was making the film Ed went off to make a Paul Harcastle song with Paul Harcastle his new song about the train robbery, the great train robbery, and his voice is in the great train robbery single made by Paul Highcastle. Really? Oh, wow. Wow. If you listen to that single called The Train Robbery by Paul Highcastle, he's the American voice in it. He ah. went off to do that while we were filming the Metal Jacket. Right. He's then be on wow. credit, but he, he, yeah, he went off to do that. Yeah, it's a good day to die. <laughs> there we go. Do, do you know mm-hmm. that? Did you hear that song in the States, Jason? That- I've heard it before, yeah. I don't know if it was a, a big chart hit, but, I, you know, I was always exploring for any new music from across the pond, as they say, always, always looking for new British music. You, you do know that a Full Metal Jacket song got into the charts here, don't you? And he got to yeah. number two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That actually got, yeah, that got, yeah, yeah. I want to be your drill instructor. I want to go yeah. up all my hair. We had to learn all that. And obviously, we had to learn the rifle thing. And because so, so um, I remember um, her filming us singing all that on, on, on the on the training bit. So whether that's my voice is in that somewhere, I don't know. Because um, I remember her filming it and it became a big hit and got to number two in the charts. Can you believe it? That's obviously, crazy. Obviously, they had to cut it out a bit. They, yeah, they must have cut some of it because they couldn't have put like, um, you know, Eskimo Pussy's Mighty Cartwood. I don't think that yeah, would have gone well yeah, on BBC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> top of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, 
uh, the twelve inch version had a remix on it, and the remix was actually actually called uh, the Eskimo Pussy Remix. On the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was on the beast. I, I think I've got that. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it, I think I've got that, but I, I, if I lost them, I didn't. I'll have to have a look at that now. Yeah, the twelve inch <laughs> version. And, and I, I have the tw- yes. 12 inch single. Well, that was released for DJs because it was so big in the clubs at the time. Yeah, and, and then there was another version where I think they were trying to um, kind of make it a bit more family friendly and they called it the Eskipo Musse mix. Yes, yes, I remember that one. That was the American version. <laughs> yeah. They, they ran that on, on PBS. It was oh, very safe. Oh, very yeah, tame. That, yeah, it, it was probably the American, <laughs> yeah, probably the American version was that, yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've got the I've got the seven inch I've got the seven inch signed by Matty Modine as well. Oh wow! Oh, that's <laughs> he, cool. he signed he signed it for me. So I've got that. I'll keep me get it framed. But um, I've got the seven inch signed by him. Yeah. Hey, that, that, cool. that that'd look nice in a frame. Get that done. Yeah. He's the dude that made uh, the Shining and Full Metal Jacket. He's also a guy who doesn't who makes movies that brothers can't participate in. You know, The Shining can't no black people in that one. As soon as something went down that house, we'd have packed up our shit and get the fuck up out of there, boy. Like, I saw the, the I think I saw the newer one. Uh-huh. Not the one with uh, Jack Nicholson. There was a revised one. I don't yeah, know who was in it. The TV. Version. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw the, I saw the lawn uh, bushes move. I'm like, fuck this shit. I'm going, <laughs> babe, get your shit. Let's go. Get, oh, let's get the kid, fucking kids. And that kid's head is spinning. Fuck him. Get the, get in the damn car. We out of here. The black people don't do this shit. They That's would, why we leave. We they, always leave. They wouldn't be in the shining. No, we be... Oh, no, no. Just, just how it smell like it's fucking haunted. Get the shit. Get out of here. That's why any any movie you hear where they say everyone going to this house has died. Who's the last person to walk in the house? The black guy. Why? Because, like, bitch, why are we on this block? Why are we here? Like, get around a bunch of brothers and have a noise go off somewhere in the distance. It don't have to be a gun. Just a noise they can identify. They all stop. What, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> they could be arguing with each other about to kill each other. Yo, your mother. Hey, what's up? Hey, hold up, bro. You heard some shit? You heard some shit? They all do it. It's natural. We just don't fuck with any of that. I don't so, care. All right, so now wait a minute. So, like, you, you're a fan of Full Metal Jacket, too. Yeah. There's some brothers in that movie. There are, but you notice how none of them, the, how the colonel was not fucking with none of them. He was fucking with the fat white dude <laughs> because you got my face said some shit. I'm like, brother, you about to send my ass to the brig because they ain't going to disrespect me like that. I'll fuck your ass up. <laughs> Try me. Try it. You're going to catch these hands. But I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's certain things in certain movies you gotta be careful. Like, hey, yo, what's up? What's going on over here? Like when, like you know how when uh, I forgot what his name, the fat, the, the guy that ended up shooting himself. Go, go, Gomer Pyle. Gomer Pyle shot himself. Yeah. You know, saw how crazy he looked. Yeah. A brother could not walk in a room, see that dude's eyes like that. Like, nope. He about to do some shit. <laughs> Fuck out of here. He about to do something. Mm-mm, we don't. So you just say here, if he if I see a dude sitting in the bathroom, not using the bathroom, he just sitting in the bathroom <laughs> looking like this. <laughs> Like I'm leaving. I'm like, nah. He he got he got some things to work he out. Some I got to, to go. Out. So you're, I gotta so put you're a saying, fire out so somewhere in the if, next state. If, well, are you saying if Gomer Pyle was a black guy that he wouldn't be? No. Like, if Gomer, if a black guy walked in on Gomer Pyle, he'd be like, <laughs> no. I just walked right out. I'd get my shit. I'd left the military. I'd left the army. I wouldn't but be what part if? Of them. Okay. So what if? Uh, um, uh, sergeant, uh, uh, you know, was the, the, the drill sergeant. What if he was a black dude? Like, what would he? He'd have put- shot him right away. There's no reason we didn't discuss that shit. Nah, bang, nah. There's something he's possessed. Something wrong with him. And the rest Sitting of the movie would have worked out fine. You exactly, say exactly. All right. Shot him immediately. Would Kubrick have made that movie though? No, nah, probably not. He's not. He's not a fan of uh, movies that brothers would actually participate in. We don't do that shit. <laughs> When we was on the set in Full Metal Jacket, no one would have met Stanley yet. We hadn't met him for quite a bit before we started filming because we was going through different things. And then one day, uh, one of the, I think Chris, who was our um, chap who used to look after all us, like, he said, Stanley's coming today. So I next went, this big Mercedes pulls up car and this first this bloke gets out with a beard, scruffy-looking bloke, we ignored him. And then someone said, that's Stanley. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we were like, oh, no. <laughs> we, we, we didn't, he had a pair of old green flash pumps on. He had some flary jeans on and just a green sort of um, military shirt on. But we, we were looking for this next bloke to walk out, and then someone said, that's Stanley. That's yeah. Stanley. We were like, <laughs> oh, shit, that's him. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, That's great. Good day.
I, 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 all the ones I work with on all those scenes, I remember them. And if you show me a picture, I remember but names. I can't remember. Actually, the sad thing about it is one of the chaps we worked with on all the um, on the scenes, um, he died when we was um, filming. Um, he had a motorbike crash and passed away oh, in London on on the day. Um, he, oh, he, wow. You can see him on some of the scenes. His name was Frank, and um, he was an ex-soldier as well, only our age, but. Um, with the money we was earning, we was on good money. He um, bought himself a big bike to get from the East End to the set. And um, the, at the day after I left, actually, one of them rang me and said, uh, my parents had him and says, oh, Frank died. And I saved with him for quite a few things. So he was like 20, 21 years old and he, and he had oh, a crash man. with the bike he bought from the set and he passed away on, on that day. And it was, they had a, they had um, a big, um, thing on the set apparently but I wasn't there about it and um, he passed away unfortunately from buying this bike from the money we were earning to get to the set because we had we were all a good a family together at, at the end of it all and um, and yeah he passed away on, on somewhere in London on his motorbike so that was quite sad wow mm. yeah wow that is mm. Mm. so he's Frank I can't remember his surname but um he had a flat in the East End and he used to let us stay around there quite a lot and then he used to take us to the, the East End pubs and we went to a few night jobs with him. It's actually because um, Gurma Pyle, um, he used to get us a lot of um, tickets for the nightclubs in London. I don't know how he got them. Matthew didn't because Matthew lived with his family, didn't he, in London when he was filming. But, mm-hmm. um, but G- Gurma Pyle, he used to get us tickets for the nightclubs. So, at weekends or at night, we used to go into the um, into London and and have flash these tickets to get us all into the nightclub. So that was all good. The um, Park Lane and all these different nightclubs because you used to get the tickets. So if he if he watches this, thanks for getting us them tickets. <laughs> yeah, wow. that, that, that's uh, all good stuff when you're in your early twenties, isn't it? Everyone's running around looking for fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, my my first experience on ringing my parents from a cell phone was on the set of Full Metal Jacket but it wasn't a, a cell phone like we see now it was a briefcase with a phone on the top of it Sat- and, the bloke phone. Who used, <laughs> yeah. and the bloke who used to supply the cars and the vehicles he used to stay overnight in a big Winnebago and I one night I, I was a bit desperate to sleep somewhere and he said stay in my Winnebago and then I said what's that there and he said that's my, that's my phone I said, can you ring like normal houses from that phone? Obviously, the only phones we see in them days was on Star Trek. You know, doop, doop. <laughs> and then um, he's, um, he said, yeah, yeah, go on. He told me what to do. And I ran my mum. And I remember saying, mum, she goes, where are you? And I said, I'm on the set. She goes, what do you mean on the set? I said, I'm ringing you from the mobile. What the hell's a mobile? I said, a phone. <laughs> she said, no, 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 you have to phone me from a house to ring. And I said, no, this is cordless, mum. I'm in the middle of the set ringing you. And she still to this day don't believe me. God, yeah, and that was a way back then. Eighty-five, yeah, flipping out. Yeah, they were the times. I remember the first ones. They used to they used to call them a breeze block. The early ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stick out your pocket. You'd be alright if you were going to get mugged with one of them because you'd just hit them with your phone. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the big, I think the big box on the bottom was basically the battery, wasn't it? You know. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was the battery. Yeah. It was the size of a suitcase. Yeah, and the phone yeah. attached to the top. Now we 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 briefly saw you uh, in you know the, some of the scant footage that exists uh, shot by Stanley's daughter Vivian and uh, as appears in the documentary Stanley Kubrick: A Life in Pictures and it's been stated that Vivian shot many hours of footage but you know only a few snippets and not much else have ever been seen publicly. Um, what are your re- recollections of? Uh, seeing Vivian shooting on the set. Um, yeah, she was, she was, she was, she was quite, she was everywhere. I remember her us, you know, even sitting down having our dinner and she would go around with a camera. I remember filming, uh, filming a lot of us doing our training, our military training, because we did that in our normal civilian clothes, because obviously we didn't need the, the military stuff on. And, um, with, um, Lee Ermey shouting at us and screaming at us and, um, you know, and with all these, yeah, right, yeah, right, and, and all this, which we didn't understand what it meant. We were English, <laughs> and um, yes. and and to her filming loads of loads of that, and she used to film a lot of stuff behind, obviously behind the scenes as well. Us having dinner, um, Stanley talking to the other people, and then us doing our drill and learning the American way of marching. Right. 
And of course, she worked as you know with a, a pseudonym as Abigail Mead on the soundtrack for the film. So imagine she was, uh, and she she did a lot of the really experimental and avant garde, you know, soundscapes, uh, if you will, like during the sniper scene, the, the sounds of like scraping metal and clanking <clears throat> mm. uh, sounds. That was also uh, her work, her art. One okay. day when we were on the set. Um, before they set it all up when we were still doing the training, um, a load of um, articulated lorries were coming onto the set with um, skips on them with all palm trees sticking out the top of them. They must have drove that from, well, apparently they came from Spain, so they must have got them from the from the port and then drove, I mean, London must have thought, where the hell are they going? All these <laughs> lorries turned up with these skips on them full of mud and obviously with um, palm trees on them. Well, um, <laughs> this one, but <laughs> so um, that's that, that's, and the, that's how, what a, a skip is, and I forgot what I was going to say. Now, what was we on about? Was it about the uh, burning tires? No. Yeah, yes, yeah, it. Stanley got a skip and he filled them with tires and said, from what we didn't see him do this, but someone said, oh, Stanley's gone and made a boo boo here, and he filled, he chucked petrol over them, and they they set fire to them. And if you see, remember the scenes in the film, there's loads of black smoke. Uh, when when the buildings are on fire, mm-hmm. well, that was that's how he did the effect for that. Whether his daughter had anything to do with it, I don't know. But the next minute, we had the, the police turn up on the site, saying um, there's been a massive big hoo ha in the centre of London because you're polluting the whole of the, the centre right. of London with this right. black smoke. So everyone everyone thought there was a a big fire somewhere. So that was quite a funny a scene with the police turning up saying you've got a you got to sort this out. You can't you do this. This, this is wrong. That reminds me of the story. Yeah. That reminds me on the story of the of the film uh, he made prior to that, which was The Shining. Uh, he used uh, for the fake snow. He used, I, I think it was a mixture of paper and salt or something, and it basically blew all over. You know, for miles around, and he got in trouble with the local council with that one as well for mm. like for like polluting the uh, you know it, leaving set and uh, ending up. In people's gardens and things, so yeah, a similar kind of thing. Wow! It, it, it seemed it got, there to, go. it got to any length to get the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he did. He definitely did that. Even That's with the little lady with the yeah. So there's another thing what he did. But um, hey, that's what happens when he makes films. When you make masterpieces, especially, yeah, you go all in. Yeah, all in. Yeah. Now, do you, speaking out, yeah. of you know, do you do you remember uh, the first time you saw the finished film? Uh, I remember seeing the finished film. I um, I watched it in a in a town not far from me called Coventry at the Odium Cinema, and um, that's where I got the poster from because it, the poster was on in the front of the thing. And I said, "Can I have that?" I was actually in the film, and the bloke said, "By all means." And then when the film's finished, come back and I put it away for you. And then he said, "You know the original poster." Did, did you happen to have your uh, any family and friends with you when you went? And uh, if so, what did what did they have to say about the film? And uh, I imagine they must have been proud of your participation. Any of your family involved well, with you? At the time in that when it, it came to Coventry before it came to my hometown, Leamington Spa. So I went with my mate Alan. We went to watch that in Lem- in, in Coventry. <laughs> the only trouble was we didn't watch, see it much because every time there was a seat on, I was saying, that's me, that's me. That's right. me. And he's right. like, shut up, I want to watch the film. But I hadn't seen the, <laughs> but I hadn't seen the film yet. And um, I remember the chap in front of me saying, can you be quiet? I said, sorry, mate. And, and my mate saying to him, he was in this film. And the bloke turned around again, was you really in this film? I went, yeah. And, he, and this bloke said, oh, really? Wow, I can't believe that. And then um, it came to Leamington then. And I went and then I went with my parents to watch it and my brother and so on. So, um, yeah, yeah, I feel um, quite privileged to have, being where I was at the time and what happened to get in it, you know, it's still a massive talk now. Recently, I was at a, a 55, um, 55th birthday party and this chap came up to me and says, I know your name, but I can't think who you are. It's bugging me. And I said, oh, Adrian Bush. And he went, Adrian Bush, ah, I know you are now. I've seen you in Full Metal Jacket. And I'm obviously, I'm a, a lot of people wow. in, in my town know, know I was in the film Full Metal Jacket. And then, so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite well known for being in that, and a lot of people put, don't put me across as Adrian Bush. They go, "Do you know Adrian Bush? You know he was in Full Metal Jacket." And then they're, that's "Oh yeah, cool. the lad from Warwick." So that's pretty cool for me. My wife didn't oh. like it. She says, "Oh, here we go again. It was thirty <laughs> years ago." <laughs> oh man, 
That's crazy. You should, I mean, wear that as a badge of honor. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud of being in that film, being, the, in my eyes, the best. You know, I've seen Platoon and everything, but I still think with this starting from the beginning of joining the Army to the end of it, it it's just makes it the better film, I think. Uh, you're not going to get any argument out of me. I agree 100%. Mm-hmm. Now, now, one person we haven't mentioned in, in about Full Metal Jack is Leon. Mm. What was his surname? Vitaly. Vitaly. Vitaly, Vitaly yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he Talk was sort of Stanley's right-hand man. Everywhere Stanley went, he was behind him. He, 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 he was him. his... Well, he was a nice chap. The funny thing was, um, not not knowing at the time, and then I was coming home, and then I started speaking to my friend one day at home. He owned his own little um, clothes shop in Leamington. And he said, what are you doing? So I'm on this film. He said, what film are you doing? I said, oh, this Vietnam film called Full Metal Jacket. It's being filmed in London. He went, do you know Leon? I went, yeah, what do you mean by that? Then He goes, that's my uncle. <laughs> I was like, what? And then obviously when I went back to the set, Leon said to me, See, uh, Adrian, can I have a word? And he called me over and he says, where are you from again? And I said, Leamington Spa. He says, yeah, I'll just wait to see my... my um, my nephew and um, I didn't realise he was from Leamington Spa I was born in Leamington so he was actually he was born here where I'm from so that was quite interesting now I've actually someone on set telling me he's from my hometown I'm the only one from this town here so and then and then Leon was from here as well so he was um, obviously Stanley Kubik's right hand man I don't, but he's not on the, he's not on he's, what is his name on the credits as I think it's, sure. I think it's assistant to the director Ah, uh, yeah, because he he was his his man. He was he, you know anything Stanley wanted to get across to anyone, he'd tell him and he would come across. Because I remember him more bollock in this. Uh, we had to learn the um, this is my rifle. So there are many like it, but this one is mine. My wife is my best friend. It is my life. Yeah, Without my wife, yeah. I am useless. And then we had to we were we cocked it up a few times in rehearsals, and he went mad at us. You effing idiot! You need to get all this right. And we all went back away, and, <laughs> and we got it right in the end. Yeah. That, but that was coming from Stanley. Stanley wouldn't speak to us like that. Stanley would quietly say the F word, and you would hear right. him slightly if you were by him. But Stanley wouldn't be one of those ones who would F and blind at you and swear. He would always get someone to do it for you, to go back to you, to tell you. Yeah. Which was quite nice in a way. You probably didn't want to see him like that. Right. <laughs> so, um, so, Aidy, you mentioned uh, that when you bought the uh, seven-inch single of I Want to Be a, a Drill Instructor um, and Matthew Modine signed it, um, I believe he, you also got in touch with him after shooting wrapped, and uh, he did write you back and uh, sent you a signed photo. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Um, one of the uh, – in the, um, the format of um, the book um, that he brought out, the um, – Metal Full Metal Jacket Diaries. Diary, yeah. And the There's app, a picture which... in there of someone in gold. That's that picture of me is the only picture of someone in gold in the book. Well, that's me. Um, no Matthew had an old, yeah. Matthew had an old time camera, and he went round and took pictures of, of with this camera. And it was the scene with me as an MP. He just came up to me and says, "Hey, Leo, can I get your picture?" Uh, it's my own personal. Said, yeah, of course, can. And that's the picture he took. And then out of the blue, one day, I just had a a letter come through the post um, and it was that picture um, 280 from Matthew Modine and, and there's some cool on my wall that? now obviously so that was I was like whoa this is really cool then obviously I got to know him through um, he, he, the chap who does a lot with him who's always on the internet I can't remember Adam Rakoff Adam Rakoff yeah and, and um and Adam Rat well, so everyone had pictures on the film and I sent them the pictures I had, had at the time which I and um and, and I said, oh, well, Matthew signed this for me, the, the, the single. And he says, of course he will, just send it across, I'll sort that out for you. And um, <laughs> and now Matthew gets in touch with me through um, the media now, and we speak to each other through Twitter, and then we do a few personal ones and that. Matthew Matthew was a um, a funny eater as well on the set. He I think he was a vegetarian, I might be wrong, but... He, he used to put out some food. I remember, you know, just me and him in his caravan. I because mean, I used to get on with Matthew quite well. And we used to go in, I used to go into his Winnebago and, and not be with the lad sometime. And he'd say, yeah. try this, Aidy. I said, what is it? He said, no, this is really good for you. This, 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 this will put hairs on your chest. And he'd <laughs> say, you know, try this and try this. And I used to try some of these foods and go, oh, what is that? I can't eat that. But um, he'll he vouch for you on that if you contacted him. He used to, 
and made his own food and bring his own food in from home sometimes on the set. And it was all, what, I think what he was, was vegetarian. It? What was it he got you to try that was so uh, unpalatable? Uh, to- all I can remember, it was green and I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a meat eater. I, I, I'm pretty sure he was a vegetarian then. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure on that. I, I, but um, I just remember him having them in these containers and this different food and me trying this different food and Matthew Modine's on 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 on, on in his Winnie Bago because they all had their Winnie Bagos, but they used to spend a lot of time with us and sure. eat with us because we used to have a good laugh and it was good fun and playing soccer or it, now and again we'd say, not against to play soccer, let's play baseball now. We play baseball because that's their sport, or that's then right. we play soccer because that's their sport. And and someone coming up just one day saying, Stanley said, if you're going to play, don't none of you get hurt, please, because you're on the set. Right, right, Especially right. Matthew. And, he had, and Matthew had to call back a bit and not run around and be silly because if he got hurt, obviously yeah. that wouldn't be good for the main thing. Yeah, it would have shut down production, obviously. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's really cool that you guys have uh, maintained a friendship. and um, just Definitely, like, you know, definitely genuine person, Matthew Modine. Nothing, nothing, how can I put it politely? Nothing pompous about him. He's down to earth. He's one of the guys. He's not anyone different when he's on that set. He does his work. He's a professional and he's just a nice guy. Yeah. And my mom's had a crush on him for about 30 years, maybe longer. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She must have loved him in, in the Cutthroat Island then because he's, he's half naked in that all the time. Cutthroat I don't know Island. if she saw that one. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know if she, I don't know if she saw that one. I'll ask her. Um, yeah, that's a good so, thing. So, do you recall any instance whereby either Stanley made you laugh or you made Stanley Kubrick laugh? I think he used to laugh a lot of them um, when they used to get get some of the, the things wrong. And, and I, I remember him laughing when um, Kevin Major Howard actually got the final bit done, and and <laughs> and, and, he, and he and he laughed at that and sort of. Thank God for that. It took us all night, Kevin. <laughs> and I think he laughed at that. And, um, and, and um, I mean, it's hard to remember. It's that long ago. But no, the guy did laugh sometimes. I mean, a lot of people said he was always serious. But no, I remember him laughing. I, I actually think I've got a picture somewhere, like I said, in my loft with him laughing. But that's another one I've got to have to find out and, and oh, get it please. out. But um, yeah, he um, yeah, he did laugh. Um, he, he was just a professional through and through. Um you knew where you were with him and then um, he knew where he was with you. That's awesome. Now my, that leads to my other question, you know, which is if there were ever an opportunity that you and Stanley were having a, a conversation, even regarding just something as straightforward as what uh, your character should be doing, uh, your um, uh, position in the shot, uh, your blocking, et cetera, um, any, <clears throat> anything at all. Um, was there ever a moment when uh, Stanley gave you a bit of advice on anything? The only thing I can remember him saying to me is, in the scene where the camera's filming us, and and if you remember, they get me and I do my eyebrows, um, he actually said, look, you're looking at a camera here, do, do some movement, and this is going to go home, because that footage they were filming was supposed to be going back to America of the soldiers in Vietnam. So okay. I was the first bit to show my eyebrows, but then it goes on to the, the others talking, doesn't it? And they're going, Hey mom, how you going? And we're here in Vietnam and, and it goes along. So, so um, that's the only time I can remember him talking to me saying, yeah, you're flash- you can do your eyebrows. Cause I did it. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get bollocks for this, but I didn't. He said, no, that's fine. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick is a um, a master at his work. He's the Father Christmas of directors. Hmm. Um, he's a nice guy. He, he um, and there's nothing more you can say about him. I didn't know Stanley Kubrick like everyone else said until the film I was in, Full Metal Jacket, was being done. But since then, I've gone back and watched his films and watched some of his films and The Shining and Clockwork Orange and, and the one with Tom Cruise. In. And um, I don't think there's any other films made like his because they are so different. And every film he's made, he's been different. He's just, a, he's just a masterpiece of what he did and he's proven that in his films. He doesn't need to say any more because the films show what he can achieve. 
Brilliant. The film speaks for it all. Too cool. Adi was a great guest, and we really hope you enjoyed hearing a very different first-hand account of life on the set of Full Metal Jacket by someone who was there. I'd like to thank Chris Williams for his brilliant and hilarious contribution to our ongoing segment, Who is Stanley Kubrick? Chris definitely needs his own Netflix comedy special. Also, our thanks to Mark Lentz and James Marinaccio for their assistant research and help. My unending thanks, of course, to the coolest producer cat who ever purred at a mixing console, our producer, Stephen Rigg. Please make sure to subscribe and throw likes at Kubrick's Universe. It keeps us going and makes us smile. Like this. This smile. This smile I'm smiling right now. Can you feel it? I can feel it. Hey, drop into the world's coolest and longest-running Facebook group for Kubrick, the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society. You'll find a wealth of information, insight, kindred spirits, and time well spent in SCAS. Coming up next, we're going to have an interview with Mike Scott. Mike was responsible for creating the most faithful replica of the spacesuits and helmets from 2001 A Space Odyssey. So impeccable that one was approved by the Kubrick estate for inclusion in the traveling exhibition. I was fortunate enough to see it in person in January 2020 at the premiere of the exhibit Envisioning 2001 Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey at the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens, New York. And to call Mike Scott's achievement a work of art is an understatement of galactic proportions. We'll have that one for you very soon. As it is now July 2020, I'd be remiss to forget saying, we hope you are all doing well in these trying times and hopefully keeping safe. Anyone want to design and market a mask painted like Moonwatcher? Or one of the other man apes? Could be a money idea. I'm just saying. Just don't forget us at Kubrick's Universe when Etsy and eBay big bucks start rolling in. Okay, until next time, I'm your host and humble narrator, thanking you for listening once again to the show we love making for all of Stanley's fans everywhere. Especially you. Take care and smell you later. You lovely and intoxicating plume of black tire smoke, you. It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. Listening to the Stanley Kubrick podcast. All right. I believe my work for the day is done here. Come back soon. It was real nice talking to you. Bye. Over and out. These guys aren't scientists. They're making it up as they go along. This show comes to you from the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society.